Man Up, brought to you by Construction Professionals, a program dedicated to inspiring and helping men live lives of heroic virtue. Join Joe Stopulis and Father Zach Kowski every Monday at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. on Iowa Catholic Radio. And now, it's time to man up. Another year goes by, more leaves, more smoke. Welcome to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. We are broadcasting from the Mercy Live Up Studios, heard on 1150 AM, 88.5 FM, and 94.5 FM. Around the globe, streaming online at iowacatholicradio.com and on the Iowa Catholic Radio app. Also, please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and like us on Facebook. I am Joe Stopulis, along with Father Zach Kautsky. Today, we're joined by the voice of the Iowa Hawkeyes, Gary Dolphin. And the topic for today's show is the greatest generation. Father Zach, would you please open us up in a word of prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example and the inspiration of the greatest generation. We ask you to give us the virtues of loyalty, hard work, and personal responsibility in all that we do. And we ask... uh, that our prayers would be heard today through the intercession of Mary as we pray. Hail Mary, full, full of grace, grace, the Lord, Lord is with thee. Blessed, blessed art thou woman. amongst women. Blessed, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, God pray for us sinners, sinners now and at the hour of our death. death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, so this is a unique episode for us. Uh, we're having a sportscaster on to talk about faith in the greatest generation. So it's a little interesting, but the the setup is... My grandfather uh, knew Gary Dolphin, and Gary Dolphin uh, had an affinity for my grandfather and the service he had for our country. Uh, Father Zach has a uh, holds the greatest generation in esteem, and said that we need to have a, uh, a an episode on what we can learn from them. And obviously, we all were on the same page, and so we reached out to Gary uh, to see if he would do it. And you know, it worked out really well for him, and he was happy to join us. While he, the clip we're going to play first here is the interview he did with my grandfather to give you a taste of. Uh, the the service uh, of the of the greatest generation. And when was the interview? So the interview was when he was ninety seven. So it been about three or four years ago. Three years ago, uh, and it was played for I believe Veterans Day of a football game, mm-hmm. and then they rebroadcasted it. So he died a couple months ago uh, in, in January of eighteen. He actually died on the day of the twenty fifth anniversary of Chris Street's death, which is kind of crazy. Um, and he then they played this for the, the next basketball game afterwards. So we're gonna head to it, uh, and you'll get a taste of, of Gary Dolphin interviewing uh, my grandfather uh, about his service in the war. Mr. Great Hawk, a few days ago, 100-year-old Jim Stopulus from the Quad Cities, Davenport, died. Uh, Jim was uh, so much more than a Great Hawk fan, though. He was a World War II decorated uh, combat veteran. Here's an interview I did with Jim Stopulus of Davenport three years ago on Veterans Day prior to a Hawkeye football game. It was just after midnight in the wee early morning hours of June 6, 1944, when young GIs from every state, including Jim Stopulus of Davenport, got the word from General Dwight David Eisenhower by air and sea and then land. The Allies stormed Normandy, the beaches of France, uh, and they were named Omaha and uh, Utah and Juneau and Gold. It became the longest day. Thousands upon thousands, ships, planes, troop transports, charged the Nazis, charged the machine gun nests, the pillboxes and the tanks. There would be a 75% casualty rate of 22,000 troops that first day, 70 years ago. Jim Stopulus was a 27-year-old, a 27-year-old B-17 commander with a flight crew of 10. And I can see all those ships on the on the English Channel heading for the French coast. And that was on the great sights, and I'll never forget that as long as I live. Just it was kind of thrilling. But hell, I had, of course I had to watch what I was doing. But nevertheless, it was thrilling. Thrilling. Can you imagine, uh, Jim Stopulus? He thanks Eisenhower and his staff for his well-timed, well-planned, perfect assault. I mean, between the boats and the. The troops and the aircraft, there's every area. We were cautioned the night before that was the big mission was on. And everybody was going to fly. And you, when you got out, the, you got out in the air, there were B-17s, B-24s, B-20s. Every aircraft was, they could fly could fly that day. It was just amazing. And it, the sky was full of planes, and the water was full of boats. You know, and I was full of boats. You know, you know what? <laughs> did, when, when did you realize, if you did realize, that, hey, uh, this thing is so big, we could be making history here? 
I didn't, didn't give it, didn't give it a thought. I know it's just new. I know there's a lot of action going on, and uh, uh, they said this, this. They said when they told us in the briefing, this is the big one's going to make the big difference. Well, and I did. It certainly did. Jim Stopulus, now 97 years young in the Quad Cities, a B-17 commander. Uh, who stormed, along with troops, uh, 25,000 other troops, the beaches of Normandy. Uh, Eddie Podolak, uh, we can't thank our veterans uh, of all uh, services, men and women, uh, enough uh, on this special Veterans uh, Memorial Weekend. Your dad fought at the Battle of the Bulge, as I remember. No, he was in the South Pacific. Oh, Joe was in the yeah, South Pacific. He, uh, oh, his buddy fought at the Battle yeah, of the Bulge. They, uh, they, that's had, what it was. Uh, yeah, they had five landings. He was in five landings, and that's... Um, so he was battling the Japanese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It well, was different. Uh, it's a special weekend. Different theater, but uh, it was war, and um, we're fortunate that uh, you know it solved a lot of problems at the time. Not that we still don't have a lot today, you know. Indeed, uh, that was an interview uh, conducted with that 97-year-old Jim Stopulus on football game day from Kinnick Stadium uh, three years ago in 2014. Jim Stopulus made it to 100 and passed away. This weekend, his funeral was held yesterday over in uh, in the Quad Cities. And uh, rest in peace, uh, Commander. That was an interview between Gary Dolphin and my grandfather on his service during World War II on D-Day. Uh, when we re- we're headed to a short break, and when we return, we will have Gary Dolphin on to talk about the greatest generation. Thank you, construction professionals, for underwriting our show, Man Up. Construction professionals have been long supporters of Iowa Catholic Radio, and we've seen their work firsthand. It's very impressive. They do remodeling or new construction that is innovative, functional, and designing what you want. cpcustomhomes.com. Welcome to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. We are broadcasting from the Mercy Live Up Studios, heard on 1150 AM, 88.5 FM, and 94.5 FM. I am Joe Stopulis, along with Father Zakowski, and today we are joined by Hawkeye legend, Gary Dolphin. Gary has been the voice of the Iowa Hawkeye football and men's basketball teams since 1996. He's also the voice of the weekly radio show Hawk Talk. In addition to his work with the Iowa Hawkeyes, he's also a history buff, which is what brings him to the Man Up show to discuss what we can learn from the greatest generation. Dolph, welcome to the show. Hey, Joe. Father, good to be with you. I don't know about Hawkeye legend. I, oh, I, 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 I reserve that for uh, guys like Niall box. Kinnick and, uh, and Ed Podolak, but uh, I'll, I'll accept it on this, on this occasion. Okay, I'll very good. Yeah, this, you, you cannot <laughs> contradict the show hosts, okay? You're a Hawkeye legend in our mind. With that, so all that matters. So we, uh, we played already this episode, uh, the interview you did with my grandfather, uh, which was... Which got us inspired. Father Zach had said something to me, um, you know, when I, when I played that interview for him. He was, "We need to have a show on the Greatest Generation." Uh, and I said, "Well, I, you know what? Let's just ask Gary if he'd jump on." So that's why you're on. I know you're, uh, you know, my my family spoke highly of you and said that you're really into uh, into history. And so we said, "Let's see if we can get you on and, and talk about it." So thank you so much for joining us today. Well, I appreciate it. I'm happy for the opportunity. I, I grew up uh, in a small town, Iowa. And as you folks know, uh, uh, small town Iowa certainly did its part uh, uh, with the greatest generation in sending uh, m- many of our uh, ancestors, our grandfathers, our uncles, great uncles, uh, to World War II and the European theater. And, and when you think of uh, the reasons they went to uh, to uh, stem the, the, the tide of uh, uh, Nazi uh, Germany and uh, Imperial Japan and for all the wrong reasons, uh, their, their intent in, uh, in uh, taking over the world, and certainly uh, Western Europe and, and beyond. Who knows uh, if Hitler and Japan had succeeded, uh, what kind of a world we'd have today. And uh, the Jewish people suffered greatly for that in particular, but uh, many more millions pa- uh, perished as well. And uh, I've always been a huge military history buff, particularly the Civil War, because of what this country that we live in could look like today had had uh, uh, the Confederacy uh, won that uh, particular battle, we'd probably have two United States of Americas, and, and I, I don't like that thought. But I, I think uh, as, as much as we all detest and hate uh, the very meaning of, of war, uh, it, it's been necessary a number of times to, uh, to straighten some people out and, and, to, and, to, and to put this world back on track, uh, as I think the good Lord would have uh, wanted it. What do you think are some of the big lessons that we can learn from the greatest generation? 
I think uh, uh, dedication uh, to duty, to honor, to uh, God, to country. Uh, that's uh, that, that's a, a unique generation. I've had the, the, the distinct privilege of interviewing Tom Brokaw a couple times uh, when he comes back to an Iowa football game and, and talked to him, picked his brain a little bit uh, uh, when he was at the Hoover Presidential Library giving a talk uh, as he was donating all of his journalism papers to the University of Iowa School of Journalism. He, he wrote the book, The Greatest Generation, and uh, Tom's a little bit older than I am, but uh, he certainly had a, a he, he grew up in the Dakotas and uh, understood as well what his grandfather and his uncles and his dad, uh, what, what, what their thought process was, uh, first off, in leaving the farm and leaving the town, leaving the factory uh, to go fight in World War II. Uh, it was for freedom. It was for uh, our liberties, which we, uh, that's our state motto, we prize and maintain. And uh, I think it, it's as simple as that. I, I don't think they had an agenda. They were asked to serve their country, particularly uh, after the Pearl Harbor, uh, Pearl Harbor bombing, which was such a uh, punch in the nose to America. And President Roosevelt uh, said it uh, the next day, I, I thought very astutely, that uh, uh, we will prevail. Uh, we, we will ultimately uh, succeed and be victorious over the evils uh, that have perpetrated uh, that particular uh, day of horror, December 7, 1941, that kind of got the ball rolling. I mean, the world was a tough place to live in prior to that. Uh, with Hitler's ascent in, in the late 1930s, it's not that the United States didn't see this coming, but uh, we took more of a pacifist attitude until, of course, uh, it struck home in Pearl Harbor and in Honolulu and it killed uh, several thousand Americans. And, and then we were we were all in. But what I love about this generation was uh, they were all in. They were they were in feet first. They uh, these young guys, uh, as young as sixteen and seventeen, would lie about their age. I think, Father, we forgive them for that sin. <laughs> yeah, they're forgiven uh, because they wanted to serve their country and their God. And uh, they, you know, they had it. They had uh, in their hearts for all the right reasons uh, uh, why they were going to pick arm, pick up arms, lay down lay down the hoe and the rake and the plow. Uh, and go fight for our country uh, for all the right reasons. And, and uh, like I said, war is a, a terrible thing. I know it gets glamorized in, in the movie screens and television and, and in books, but uh, it, in this case, it was absolutely necessary. You know, you mentioned duty, honor, and country, and I actually have the quote. I, I put this in, in, uh, in preparation for this interview. You know, MacArthur's acceptance award from West Point when, that, uh, when he kind of coined that term, and I want to read it real quick, uh, duty, honor, country. Those three hallowed words reverently dictate what you ought to be, what you can be, and what you will be. They are your rallying points. To build courage when courage seems to fail, to regain faith when there seems to be little cause for faith, and to create hope when hope becomes forlorn. And he goes on from there, but I think that is encapsulates the greatest generation to me, as they had those three things, I mean, among a lot of others, and we can get to them, but they had this, this sense of, of duty to country uh, and an amount of just this inherent honor that they, that they live for, this code with which they live for. And, uh, you know, I, I, the example I obviously use a lot is my, my grandfather, and that was just the way he talked. He said, listen, this is just something that we all did. It wasn't even a second thought. And then when they came back, again, he, he, I'm a, most of my friends would know this, that, uh, you know, I'm, I love this country and I, uh, I, I love what it's founded on. And I love the principles it's founded on. I look today, you know, there's just not the respect and reverence for the country, the idea that America was founded on. America was founded on uh, that I know my grandfather fought for, and that whole generation fought for. And then when they came back, it wasn't like they wore it on their sleeve and, and toted it to everyone. They just did their duty, and that was it. In, indeed, and, and I've always felt that when you when you look at the uh, at the slogan uh, or the terminology of duty, uh, duty honor, country. I've always felt that the second or the greatest generation uh, would would put that in reverse: uh, uh, a country, uh, and then uh, duty, and finally honor. Mm -hmm. Not that they're looking for honor, but uh, the country uh, was first and foremost uh, in their thought processes. And, and I think uh, most of them they're dying off, as you folks know, the rate of uh, hundreds per day, and there aren't many left uh, from the greatest generation. That they too uh, would be upset and are upset over the fact that uh, God has literally been taken out of the schools, uh, out of the history books, uh, on the very principles that uh, this country was founded uh, with the founding fathers and George, from George Washington to Thomas Jefferson to uh, to Abraham Lincoln, 
uh, God was always at the forefront uh, of, of what they were doing. They were doing it for his honor, uh, and that involved killing, uh, and, and uh, killing the enemy that uh, didn't uh, aspire uh, to the good Lord, as, as uh, we did. And, and, and then I, I've read up a lot on American or on world history as well, back to medieval times and the Crusades and the fighting and the wars that went on then uh, for uh, love and honor of God in certain circles. And, and uh, it's a necessary evil, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But I, you're exactly right. The, the greatest generation had country, God uh, at the uh, forefront, and then uh, duty and honor. And, and a lot of them uh, fought uh, knowing that uh, they, if they weren't facing sure uh, death, it was uh, right around the corner, and yet they had uh, such a great faith uh, when they uh, put forth uh, their efforts that they knew that uh, should they not come home, and many of them didn't, uh, several hundred thousand of them did not, that uh, they would uh, certainly enjoy eternal life with their good Lord. You know, I was thinking about my my grandparents, both my mom's and dad's parents, part of the greatest generation. Uh, one side was military. Uh, Grandpa was military on one side, and other side, dad's side, was uh, you know a farmer, longtime farmer. And I think of them and the way they treated their wives and the the reverence that they had for marriage and how that's really, really changed. I think uh, uh, we have a quote from Tom Brokaw, and you mentioned Tom Brokaw earlier. Uh, he said, um, that the, really, that the men of the greatest generation took their marriage vows seriously. And Brokaw said, it was the last generation in which, broadly speaking, marriage was a commitment and divorce was not an option. I can't remember one of my parents' friends who was divorced. In the communities communities where he li- where we lived, it was treated as a minor scandal. And, uh, of course, the numbers bear out Brokaw's you know, anecdotal evidence that uh, in 1940, one in six marriages ended in divorce, but by the late 90s, that number was one and two. And I think, uh, uh, and I'm sure you, you know, you coming from a small town, I think that was, I don't know, maybe you were in that transition period, but uh, certainly that was, even when I was younger, that was more of a, an exception was divorce. And so I think that's another way for me, certainly as a priest, that when we look at the greatest generation, we look at their fidelity to their, to their marriages. Absolutely. Uh, I grew up in the 50s and 60s, and, and growing up in a small town uh, in Iowa, in the heartland, uh, uh, divorce was a, really a foreign word. Uh, in fact, uh, as you were mentioning those numbers and those comments and thoughts, uh, I, was, I was thinking back through my days uh, when, when growing up in Cascade, a little small town, Dubuque County, uh, I, I can't think of one couple that was divorced in our community. I'm sure there was one or two, but uh, in a town that's heavily Catholic, uh, no, I I think you're exactly right. And, you know, there are many more uh, 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 easily attainable temptations uh, today with social media, uh, with the Internet, uh, with with, uh, how we, we, I say we, how the the rules have been relaxed on on, uh, the ratings of movies to uh, pornography to to what's easily accessible. And, And I think that has torn at the very fabric of what this country was founded on and what it stands for. And, and uh, you know, I'm a firm believer that everything will come full cycle, but uh, uh, maybe not Sodom and Gomorrah as bad, but uh, certainly approaching those uh, boundary lines. And uh, I'm a firm believer that uh, at some point, and, and we're seeing it with uh, shows like this, with networks uh, like EWTN and Catholic Radio and, and, uh, and, and others with podcasts uh, of this nature, that uh, the message is getting out there, and, and I and I'm, I'm encouraged. Granted, I live in a town, uh, Dubuque, that is uh, still probably seventy or eighty percent Catholic, but I am encouraged about the youth uh, of today and, and the stances, the public stances they are taking, not only uh, from a pro-life perspective, but uh, recently, uh, whether you're whether you're for uh, gun control or against it, I, I really uh, don't have a firm opinion either way. I mean, I grew up in a family of hunters too, but. Uh, we use guns the right way, but uh, there is obviously a problem or an issue uh, with the gun violence uh, today. Um, and and uh, so, what, regardless of what your opinion is, I am encouraged about our youth. Uh, uh, I speak of high school age kids primarily, but uh, it, it's permeating college campuses as well. That, that I think we are on somewhat of a right track, bouncing back to good morality, to religious values, and and to uh, faith the way it should be. 
You know, uh, when we invited, uh, when I shot you an email to try getting together, we didn't even ask if you were Catholic or not. And some people asked me, is he Catholic? I'm like, he's from Dubuque. Of course he's Catholic. He's got, <laughs> we have a very good chance he's probably Catholic. Hey, uh, uh, so one of my uh, one of my favorite books, uh, especially when it comes to the greatest generation, I, I, I'm gonna, I actually shouldn't assume you've read it, but it's uh, called Big Russ and Me uh, by Tim Russert. Um, and this was written probably, oh, I don't know. It was probably a couple of years before he died. And, it was. And it talks, it talks um, about you know, the relationship he had with his dad. So one thing, I, a plug I'll make for all of our listeners is get big. It's called Big Russ and Me. It's by Tim Russert. I love Tim Russert. Um, and it, it just speaks to the relationship he had. And his dad, to me, typifies uh, a lot of the greatest generation. And I think of my grandfather, I see a lot of parallels, specifically when it comes to work. I mean, they just didn't. It, it working more than forty hours was not even a thought, right? So if I had to get another job, I'd get another job. Um, you know, Tim Russert's dad was a garbage man, uh, and he called they called him the sanitation whatever. But he was a garbage mm-hmm. man, uh, and he took pride in his in his work. He took pride in his work as a garbage man. I know my my grandfather ran uh, ran a movie theater, and I think he got like five days off a year: Christmas, Easter, maybe a couple other days. Otherwise, he was in every single day, and that's just what you did. My grandfather got. Came home from kindergarten when he was six, and they said this kid can't speak English. He goes, "Well, yeah, he, you know, we, we only his, his dad only spoke Greek, so he learned how to speak English. You learned how to work hard. You did these things, and I think that was the that's what I learned. You know, in the big Russian me book and the example of my grandfather, it's just they just didn't even think about it. They just worked hard and, and got along and, and just did the right thing. Absolutely, and I think it gets back to uh, to the divorce rate numbers that you talked about. Uh, uh, that uh, Tim Russert's dad. I, by the way, I do have the book. I've not read it yet. I'm I'm, I'm right in the middle of Derek Jeter's book, so I, <laughs> I, I balance my military. I've got I'm about 80 books behind, to be honest with you. And every time somebody gives somebody gives me a book, now I have a, a preference to military history, of course. So I've read a ton of uh, Civil War uh, history, and uh, just got done with Killer Angels and with Rebel Yell, with which was the life and times of Stonewall Jackson, and. Uh, as uh, uh, an incredible uh, lieutenant general as he was and a leader uh, for the Confederacy. He was a deeply religious man, and, and uh, that's what I find unique uh, uh, about two sides uh, uh, tugging against each other. It's almost like a tug-of-war sometimes when we relate to religion and military. But I think it gets back to your point about Russert and his dad. Uh, you know, dad was the uh, primary breadwinner, the provider. Mom didn't work. Mom, Well, mom worked, but she raised the family. Uh, inside the home, Dad uh, would work two or three jobs, and uh, my my uh, my dad ran a, a, a convenience store long before they were called convenience stores in Cascade, with a gas pumps and oil changes and groceries and cold cuts and a, a bar room, and, and Mom helped out. And we we're seven kids in my family, and I can remember that uh, back in the day, which wasn't that long ago, when. Divorce was, uh, you know, a whisper, something, a rumor that you, you never really uh, paid much attention to because it only happened in the major cities. Uh, Dad was always there, and I, and I think we've lost that somewhat, that backbone, that very spinal cord of the American family. Hopefully we're getting back to that. So i got to ask, I know you're, you're a Catholic, and uh, i got to ask, did you serve Mass as a, as a kid? I did. I, uh, we, we had a 6.30 a.m. Mass uh, when I was in grade school, and, and of course back back in the '60s, there were you know two or three masses a day. As Father knows, there was two or three masses a day at every parish all all week long. And and uh, I've always been an early morning guy. I love getting up early in the morning. And uh, so there were some mornings it was tough for a, a fourth, fifth, sixth grader to uh, roll out of bed, especially in the winter time. But I remember my next door a neighbor lady. She was a widow and she was elderly and. She never missed mass, and she'd always pick me up uh, next door. She'd pull up to the curb, and I'd run out and jump in the car with her, and away I'd go. And I uh, come from a family of four boys and three girls, so all of my uh, brothers uh, served as well. Uh, uh, we, we had a uh, uh, an Irish broke pastor named Father Daniel O'Sullivan, and you can hardly understand <laughs> if he was Irish broke. And, <laughs> and uh you always were on time. You were 15 minutes early uh, prior to 6:30 a.m. mass, or he'd uh, he'd give you the business. But you know that, that I love that kind of discipline. As I look back, uh, I, I think about uh, the discipline of getting up at that hour as, as a young boy and, and serving mass and remembering everything that there. Of course, it was Latin then, mm-hmm. so there were a few extra uh, a few extras there you had to be uh, aware of. Uh, uh, you know, Father knows if you uh, talk about uh, serving Mass with your back to the congregation, 
today you get these funny stares, uh, and, and yet uh, there's a, a mass up in the, in our uh, community here every Sunday, a high noon, a, a Latin mass that I get to every now and then that goes an hour, hour and 15 minutes, and people look at you kind of funny when you tell them you went to a mass that lasted an hour and 15 minutes, but I, I love the quiet, I love the solitude, I, I love the Latin uh, vernacular. Uh, and I'm, I'm getting off center here, but uh, yeah, I, I was uh, I was a proud altar boy for a few years. Went to a Catholic high school. Ultimately, it closed, like like most of our Catholic high schools in rural America. And uh, hopefully, we get back to that someday. Well, hey Gary, again, appreciate. First off, I want to thank you for everything you do with my grandfather. Again, I know it meant the world to him uh, to have those conversations with you and the the, the interview you did with him and just uh, everything you did for our veterans. So thank you uh, again for that. My pleasure, uh, Joe. My pleasure. And, and your, your grandfather, again, uh, that is on my bucket list. Uh, I've, I've been to every, uh, my buddy and I have been to every major Civil War theater and battlefield in the country. But left on our bucket list is uh, we've been to Little Bighorn in Montana. We're, we're going through the Wild West right now. And then uh, we are absolutely in the next few years going to get to D-Day, or to Normandy, excuse me, mm-hmm. in France, uh, uh, and 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 take that tour and and relive somewhat uh, what your grandpa and what the greatest generation went through. Yeah. Well, and thank you uh, again for that, and thank you for joining us on the on the show today. It's been a, it's been a pleasure, and again, I think we can all take so much away from this greatest generation, and we appreciate you taking time uh, to spend with us doing just that. And we're gonna head to a short break, and when we return, we will be back to wrap up our conversation on the greatest generation. <laughs> Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. I am Joe Stopios along with Father Zach and Gary Dolphin. Awesome interview. That was fun. That was great. I didn't know he was Catholic. I didn't know he was, I didn't Much know he was less Catholic. Really yeah, faithful. And, and knows what he's doing. I mean, EW, he doing. dropped an EWTN bomb there. That was fun. Yeah. Any parting thoughts on the greatest generation? You know, I was thinking as we were talking to Mr. Dolphin, uh, this idea of humility of the greatest generation that we really have a responsibility to to learn from the example of, of those who have gone before us. And maybe we don't agree with everything they, they stood for or maybe everything they believed, different generations, but I think that's really important for us to be students of history, uh, to learn from their experiences and, and have respect for uh, those who have come before us. Yeah, I think that's I think that's perfect, and there's so much to be, to be learned from that generation, especially in today's world. So uh, Iowa Catholic Radio is listener-supported. Please consider making a tax-deductible donation today at iowacatholicradio.com. And thank you again for joining us today on Man Up on Iowa Catholic Radio. For Father Zach Kautsky, I am Joe Stopulis. It's time to man up. And go Hawks. Inspiring men to live out their call to holiness with Joe Stopulis and Father Zach Kautsky. Heard Mondays at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. on Iowa Catholic Radio. Brought to you by Construction Professionals.